People have been looking for potential treasure on Oak Island in Nova Scotia, one of 13 provinces of Canada since the 1790s. Among the earliest legends is that of a sailor in the crew of Captain Kidd, a Scottish privateer or a pirate who died in 1701. The sailor alleged that a pirate treasure worth two million pounds was buried and a farmer named Daniel McGuinness found the earliest clue, a hole in the ground in 1799 that matched the descriptions. He hired two more people, Anthony Vaughn and John Smith, who found leftover items, loose ground, tool marks, and famously, oak platforms buried all across. That the island was named after. Robert Dunfeld was a researcher, treasure hunter, excavator, and somewhat of a revolutionary in this field, responsible for much of the digging on Oak Island in the 1960s. He allegedly kept some findings secret and claimed that he didn't find anything significant until his death, age 54, on 5 September 1980 in Grass Valley, California. However, the popularity of the History Channel TV show, The Curse of Oak Island, which aired 10 seasons between 2014 and 2023, paired with his son, Robert Dunfield II, publishing images of his father's photograph collection, started the rumors again in recent years. Although there is speculation that Oak Island's treasure is a hoax, many notable items have allegedly been found there, including manuscripts that may belong to Shakespeare, items brought by the Knights Templar, and even inscriptions in an undeciphered language. Here's what Robert Dunfield found on Oak Island. Robert Roy Dunfield, born on 31 December 1925 in Denver, Colorado, had wanted to visit Oak Island since 1936 when he first read a Denver Post article about its mystery. After Robert survived World War II, graduated from UCLA with a geology degree in 1956, became fluent in Spanish, and started working as a geologist and oil driller in South America in 1957. He began excavations on Oak Island in 1965 and quickly found and expanded the Money Pit site. This cavity supposedly hid pirate treasure, or at least pieces of evidence of late 18th and early 19th century expedition. To do so, Robert hired two bulldozers and two cranes, building a causeway that would be a massive ecological disaster today to bring all the equipment. However, according to official findings, he barely found anything, a piece of iron and some porcelain. However, Robert discovered distinct clay, oak, and gypsum in an ostensibly natural cave, which could suggest that the cavern was partially artificial. Oak covered the floor, and gypsum and clay formed a type of concrete. Robert never reported finding treasure, but if he did, he could have taken it without anyone noticing, thanks to heavy machinery and a personal pathway off Oak Island. Oak Island had several thorough surveys, explorations, and excavations before Robert became involved in 1965. Notable were those conducted by the Oak Island Association Company, which dug between 1861 and 1898. The Oak Island El Dorado Company, known as the Halifax Company, which got involved in 1866, and the Old Gold Salvage Group with Franklin D. Roosevelt, the 32nd USA president, as a member, which did some work in 1909. With that said, Melbourne Russell Chapel was the Oak Island owner and excavation license holder, who rejected Robert's 1965 proposal. Melbourne had already licensed the island to Robert Restall, his 18-year-old son Bobby, and their work partner, Carl Graysar, who had been digging since 1959. Unfortunately, the three dug in the Smith's Cove area and wanted to seal what they concluded was a storm drain in 1965. After digging a 27-foot or 8-millimeter shaft, Resto went to check a water draining pump and lost consciousness from hydrogen sulfide fumes in the shaft on 17 August 1965. His son tried to help, and Carl and two other men jumped in after him. Unfortunately, a visitor to the island, Edward White, only managed to save one of the two men who entered last, Andy DeMont. Dunfield was lucky to a degree. He approached Robert Restall around mid-1965 and offered to invest in his operation. After they shook hands on 15 July, 
Dunfield paid $5,000 and promised to invest $5,000 more if Restel needed it. Another investor, Dan Blankenship from Florida, also wanted to invest, but Restel turned him down, feeling that they had enough money. Dunfield told Restel that he planned to use heavy, mechanically advanced equipment to reduce the physical toll, speed up things, and make the excavation safer. That was all a novelty. All previous excavations used hand tools with the help of dynamite, small engine drills, steam shovels, and pumping machines. Restel's death left Dunfield as one of the only viable excavators, and much of the work was already done. The first Caterpillar bulldozer that Dunfield ordered arrived on Oak Island via a barge on 3 August, two weeks before the terrible incident. Therefore, the Restel family, particularly the widow Mildred, their daughter Lee Lamb, and Lee's husband Doug, agreed to sign over the controlling percentage of the license. Dunfield promised to help them financially, continue with Restel's vision of the work, and within weeks, he helped Mildred move off the island. Dan turned away some 30 days before, rushed back and joined Dunfield, but wasn't in charge. His involvement went from the proposed $5,000 invested to $1,000 because Dunfield wanted more investors. Robert wanted professionals or influential investors to be present. Therefore, he found Jack Nethercutt, who owned Merle Norman Cosmetics, and George LaPearl, a geologist working for Western Continental Corporations, who paid $35,000 each. He raised over $130,000, about $1.255 million in 2023, before 1 September 1965, when the work started. Dunfield began work with five men, which grew to seven, then 11 by 26 October. The crew stayed at Doug and Edith Eisner's Oak Island Motel and traveled daily to the site via boat service. They began their work by cleaning the site, burning brush, cutting trees, and removing boards and wooden posts left by Restel. Dunfield used the Caterpillar bulldozer to bury the pit Restel left behind and eventually concealed the flooding system. He knew that the work was done when the water he pumped became clear. It was muddy with black and green colors at the time of the Restel accident. On 30 September, the second Caterpillar bulldozer arrived, removing 12 feet or about 4 meters in diameter of a circular depression that was just as deep. They dug 15 feet or 4.5 meters above the chapel shaft where they thought the original money pit was. Dunfield brought a 70-ton hauling and harness figure Orton Crane on 10 October. Seven days later, he built a temporary causeway to bring equipment in, using 7,000 yards or 6.4 kilometers of fill, making Oak Island no longer an island. They quickly bought in a second crane and made their first discovery, a so-called hidden shaft that had pick marks. They only found old makeshift nails, cedar or juniper tree pieces, and blue puddled clay and sand-like material. The team concluded that this was the original drain system built before the first known excavations. With two cranes and two bulldozers, the crew had no problem extending the original money pit dig into a 100 foot wide by 140 foot deep area, or over 30 meters wide by more than 42 meters deep. Robert reported that he was paying $2,000 per day and that he spent $70,000 by that point which was perhaps the most expensive operation in the island's history. He admitted that they found some artifacts and a lot of oak, which slowed the digging to an inch-by-inch -inch progress, but no gold. Robert started experiencing problems with a diesel generator, which cut his work time to about four hours every 10-hour workday, as he couldn't pump enough water out. He continued finding hand-hewn logs made of hemlock, a type of wood that wasn't native to the island, so speculated that this was the floor of the treasure cave. The lease on the P&G crane expired, so Robert had to wait about 20 days until 21 December 1965 to continue digging. After work resumed and things looked promising, Robert considered going down to 155 feet, or 47 meters, but he was running out of money. He reported having 13 crew members who didn't want to work on Christmas Day, 
so the hole filled in because of rain and partial thawing. Robert also noticed many sloughs, or sections of loose sliding earth, forcing him to dump fill into the money pit. That was much safer, and he wanted to dig a tunnel for better access and potential discoveries of niches with treasure. His first significant discovery happened on 20 January 1966, when he told the public that he found a new 40-foot or 12-meter deep cavity at the depth of 140 feet or 42 meters, saying that he found plenty of oak wood and a small metal piece. He sent the metal to the University of California, which declared that it was an iron plate used for protection of some sort. George J. Green, an oil driller from Texas, stated that the new cave was likely the same one that he found in 1955 and filled with over 100,000 gallons, or roughly 380,000 liters of water. Robert indirectly confirmed this by mentioning that he was pumping 200 gallons, or 757 liters per minute. During the next two days, Robert said that he found about 1,000 pounds, or over 450 kilograms of concrete, limestone, or natural carbonate. Robert took a five-day holiday to Bermuda with his wife in early February 1966. He restarted work afterwards. He wanted to expand the new cavity to about 100 feet, or 30.5 meters in diameter and depth, and stated that the project's cost had reached $120,000. He was convinced that there was something there because he believed that the wood and gypsum on the walls and the floor were primitive cement for whoever built the cave. He also found at least two pieces of fine china and sent them to Oxford University. The institution believed them to be porcelain and dating to the early 1600s. Robert said that this would be his last attempt as he was discouraged and almost broke and would have to start drilling oil wells to bounce back financially. Sadly, he encountered many more problems. For one, natives and other excavators were upset about his causeway, so they allegedly cut the cables on his cranes with a hacksaw. Moreover, the weather wasn't kind, so his clam shovels were inefficient. Even worse, one of his crane's buckets got stuck at a depth of 68 feet, over 20 meters in the cave, forcing him to call a second crane to dig it out. Robert said on 11 March 1966, six to seven months after he began digging on Oak Island, that he was running out of nerve but would be damned if he'd quit now. He blamed workers' absence the past December for his setbacks, but was encouraged by his wife, who was by his side. He had to send his son, Robert II, who was eight, to a school in Chester, Pennsylvania, and his daughter, Sharon, back home to Canoga Park, Los Angeles. Robert stopped excavations on 22 March 1966, saying that he was going home, but wasn't ending the search. He concluded that the area that he excavated was likely a portion of the natural rock structure of carbonates named the Windsor Rock Formations. Robert said that there was a low chance that it was man-made, but added that the chambers were ideal for hiding treasure regardless. He stated that the project cost him and his investors $130,000, and that while pausing without significant fines, he would only rest once he investigated every possibility. Robert sent the investors sketches of the Windsor Rock Formation and left a small clue. He suggested that he and other excavators suspected a tunnel existed about 162 feet, or 49 meters, north of the money pit, at a depth of about 50 feet, or 15 meters. Robert explained that, if it's true, the tunnel could have an entrance above sea level, which would be great for hiding treasure. Outside of those vague indications, he didn't mention notable finds. Robert only noted finding a nail, which was apparently hammered by hand, at a depth of 75 feet or 23 meters, though Dan Blankenship expressed that it was 60 feet or 18 meters in his report. Robert finished the letter to his investors by reminding them that he prepared the filled-in cave for a quick and inexpensive excavation if he got more money. He concluded that a buried treasure could be wedged on the top of the Windsor Rock Formation, 
but clarified that he would need a core barrel to break down the solid rock and inspect the samples. Robert's original license was supposed to expire much earlier, but he extended it to 31 August 1966, when he renegotiated the contract with the Restals. Therefore, he still had time to raise more funds, and in early August, he announced that he devised a new plan using brine, a saltwater solution chilled to sub-zero temperatures with a system of pipes. That would freeze the leaking water and prevent cave-ins and washouts. Robert even stated that he'd found new shareholders, but Melbourne Chapel responded that he would have to renegotiate his contract. Unfortunately, Robert never tested his theory. His last activity was several small digs at Cave-In Pit, Shaft 4 and Shaft 5, at the Chapel Pond and on the western area of the swamp. These happened in March 1966, but got little attention, although they are the sources of most conspiracy theories. Dan Blankenship formed Triton Alliance with Dan C. Webster and David Tobias, who they bought the license from Melbourne and started excavations in 1967. The company revisited the site in 1970 and found more tunnels at Borehole 10X, 140 feet northeast of the Money Pit. Dan said that the water was muddy, but the camera may have captured evidence of human remains and treasure chests. He also claimed that he used diving equipment to explore the tunnels and thought that he saw a human hand. Robert claimed that he never found anything, but remained emotionally and financially invested in the search by becoming a shareholder in Triton Alliance. He kept up with the news while he was alive, and his shares transferred to his son afterwards. Although that wasn't publicly revealed then, Robert had cancer, and his son had to take care of him in the mid-1970s. Robert II became active on Oak Island forums in 2003 and spent the next seven years until April 2010, when he died at 52, recounting his father's story. He shared his father's previously publicly unseen field sketches and photographs, and websites such as oakislandtreasure.co.uk have a neat collection. No one in the Dunfield family mentioned a treasure or indicated that they came by some riches after 1966. Therefore, they are either proficient at keeping secrets and living below their means, or never found anything substantial on Oak Island. Thank you for spending some time with us. Make sure to like and subscribe so you never miss another video. We also handpick these videos, which we recommend you watch next. You can talk to us on all social medias or ask a question in the comments below. Thank you for being with us and we'll see you back tomorrow.